Um, welcome everybody uh, to our first uh, of the fall semester IDE uh, lunch seminars. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled to have Josh Gans with us. Um, and uh, I gotta tell you, uh, so Josh is someone whose work I have followed uh, for many years since I was a student. Um, you know, everything that he decides to dive into, uh, he, you know, brings the rigor and is um, a, a voice that I certainly listen to on all topics that he chooses to research and talk about. Um, you know, I was introduced to him in terms of his uh, scientific work around innovation. Uh, and then I relied heavily on him for uh, understanding antitrust as I thought about it in my own context, um, you know, for the book, The Hype Machine. Um, and I will tell you, no matter how productive you thought you were during the pandemic, you were nowhere near as productive as Josh Gans because he, he published two books uh, back to back in 2020 and 2021 uh, about the relationship between information and our preparation for COVID-19 and the economics of COVID-19. And today he's going to talk to us about the information requirements of preparing for COVID-29. Uh, and I, just a quick housekeeping, please mute your microphones and turn off your videos so that we're not distracting Josh. Josh, welcome. And it's fantastic to have you here. Thanks for uh, taking the time and take it away. Floor is yours. Thanks, Anand. Thanks uh, for having me here. I think it's been about a decade since I presented in this workshop. The last time I presented was um, a short book I wrote called Information Wants to be Shared. Uh, which was sort of more in my wheelhouse. Uh, uh, but uh, this, <laughs> this last year and a half, it's been all COVID all the time. And I started that uh, in March 2020, um, when uh, I thought there was so many interesting economic issues, and I'd never thought about them before, that there might be a, mm -hmm. might be a good idea to sort of produce a book that sort of explained them. And that was this economics in the age of COVID-19 that MIT Press published in, in, it's hard to believe now, April, 2020. Um, but we always had a view to, uh, you know, it was an ebook then and uh, to expanding it. And during the course of revising that book, um, I uh, expanded it and, and, and started to understand uh, that the pandemic was really an information problem. And so I wrote the, the extended version of the book was the pandemic information gap. Um, and so that was published in November last year. Um, and before, you know, I thought that was going to be it when I stopped writing that book in July. But uh, events took over and I started writing a newsletter and then other things. And then I, I put that all together into a sequel uh, book, uh, The Pandemic Information Solution, that was published in February uh, of this year. And that, that's actually available free online at, at my website, if anyone uh, is interested in that, um, which was basically how, how do you, what you know, are the things we should do to manage the pandemic? And so in that regard, um, what I want to do today is explain, you know, why I think pandemics are fundamentally an information problem, which near as I can tell is a, it's, a it's, it's obvious once I say it, I think, um, but apparently people had not said this before. And through bitter experience over the last 18 months, I know that very few people who are in decision-making uh, power um, understand this. Uh, and it has really, really hampered our response to the pandemic. And so in that regard, I, I put it forward as there's only so much, we can't do much about the current pandemic, but in thinking about future pandemics, hence the COVID-29, um, uh, we need a framework, an intellectual framework of how to do things differently. And I think uh, focusing on information uh, is the way, and I'll, I'll, I'll convince you of that. I, I mean, there are plenty of other people uh, and, and people who are more, um, clearly experts in infectious diseases who 
do express things this way uh, uh, these days. Um, um, from my uh, personal part, I bring the sort of economics of that, which is economics is very sensitive to the value of information and how it leads to decision making. And so um, that, that is a, a sort of an overarching frame that is quite useful. Um, and in, in, in many respects, epidemiology is a social science. Um, it's one that's had very little impact uh, drawn on by, by economists uh, until the last couple of years, of course, um, <laughs> which has blundered into it. Um, uh, but uh, it, it, I think there is a, a, a real need for, for a lot of the things uh, economics has to offer there. Okay, so the first message is the pandemics are manageable. And I mean, manageable right at the outset. Um, basically a pandemic occurs because you get a, uh, what you wanna do is you have an infectious person indicated here in red, uh, and you wanna take that infectious person out of the population, isolate them until they get better, and then you return them. That's what you wanna do. That's the goal here. Um, uh, that's like the ideal way to, to, to manage an infectious disease. If you don't manage that, if you don't do that, what happens is, of course, the infection spreads until everybody's, uh, got, almost everybody's got it. So that's not good because um, everybody gets sick. Um, what you're forced to do is um, you are forced to basically say, well, one way of preventing everybody from being sick is to treat them all as equally dangerous and isolate them from one another. Um, that's, that's all very well. That has obvious costs, of which I'm still sitting here at home and we are still doing this online. <laughs> that, that demonstrates that. Um, and uh, it also is not perfect. This can happen uh, and also this can happen. <laughs> So what you really want to do, again, is to isolate these infectious people before it spreads. Just to give you a hypothetical, suppose that someone who is in, infectious with, with COVID, their nose um, lit up like Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer. Then you could say, ah, you seem to have COVID. Here's what we'll do with you. <laughs> So you can see already where I'm leading to this being an information problem. The problem is that we don't have that um, with COVID. We had asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spreading of the disease. That is, people did not know that they had COVID um, and were still wandering around. And we did not know that they had COVID. So we uh, didn't have a symptom that presented itself uh, that allowed us to uh, do this thing very easily. Um, we tried, there's temperature checks, coughing, et cetera, you know, those sorts of things, but they were all very imperfect. Even temperature wasn't a great one because COVID, you have a slightly elevated temperature, not a full blown temperature. Well, you know, that's hard to measure, <laughs> let alone um, uh, uh, diagnose. We know the benefits you get from being able to identify people uh, before they become infectious. So in the previous major coronavirus potential pandemic uh, in 2002, 2003, that is SARS, um, you know, that was a very dangerous uh, virus. 10% um, of people who contracted SARS would die. That's, that's, you know, uh, it, we've been living with, you know, uh, well under 1% um, uh, with uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, but it had this one flaw um, from the virus's perspective. You would develop symptoms, which would be quite severe flu-like symptoms, um, a couple of days before you were actually infectious. Um, with, with this. Um, so what that meant is that in the places, uh, notably uh, China, where uh, this uh, coronavirus had an outbreak, uh, 
you could readily just see people who had symptoms and isolate them. Uh, and now you might be isolating people with the flu as well, but you were, you're getting pretty much all the uh, SARS cases. Um, and you can see here that while SARS was a, you know, a, a crisis at the time, um, it was pretty short lived. We eradicated it. <laughs> it was taken off or maybe it's not eradicated. If it's not eradicated, it's not, it's not, it's not with us. That pandemic lasted from January to June being, um, being uh, uh, strict on it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's nothing. It didn't spread too far around the world. It didn't become endemic. It didn't come out of those things. There's a vaccine for it. it hasn't been tested. Why? Not enough people have SARS. So can't even test it. It just sits there in storage. Um, and then more recently in 2015 with MERS, which uh, had its main cases throughout South Korea, um, which uh, had a big impact on South Korea's response to the current pandemic. MERS was even more dangerous as a coronavirus than SARS. MERS, 50% um, uh, of people um, would die from that. Um, but again, the symptoms were obvious before it was infectious. And we're talking about a, a, a two month pandemic effectively confined to, to, a, to a single country. Um, again, because you could see who was infectious. So the point about this is this is a broad principle. Pandemics are manageable. We can don't have to get to herd immunity, don't have to do any of that stuff. If you can solve what I call the pandemic information problem, which is being able to identify infectious people before they're infectious, ideally, but as soon as possible, and isolate them from other people. And that management means we solve both the health problem and we solve the economic problem as well. Um, um, now, one of the issues, of course, is, is it's hard to do it alone. And that's one of the lessons that we've found um, uh, from, uh, from, from COVID-19 is that there were countries who did this. Who, who solved the pandemic information problem. The problem they face now is the rest of the world didn't. So the way in, in, in the first book that I uh, envisaged this was it's an information problem. What we need is widespread testing. We need to have widespread testing um, as a fact of life. And if we did that, we could do this isolation game and we could bring this pandemic under control. Now, it's hard to do this when the pandemic is beyond a certain threshold and is too prevalent. But if you've locked down and then you've got it to a manageable level, you can do that. And we know that because that is exactly what China did in Wuhan. They let the pandemic go for too long. But when it got serious, they locked everybody away until the cases dropped and thereafter have managed it through testing and contact tracing, which are informational tools. But we actually had a lot more barriers than that that really impeded us. Uh, and I could go on for, for hours about the issues with testing. But one of the issues was that there was a general refusal on the part of health, public health officials to use cheaper tests. And why do you want to use cheaper tests? Cheaper tests can be done at broader scale and they can also be conducted more frequently. And the key to being able to suppress the virus uh, like this is to frequently test people. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a bit. And all the epidemiological models show that. But it's even worse than that, as I wrote in a paper in uh, July last year. Um, uh, it actually, these tests were actually more precise in terms of what we cared about. That is because there's a difference between, and I'll, I'll skip through that, they're, they're much cheaper. So your standard tests uh, that you have for uh, whether someone has COVID uh, costs about $100 a pop and requires a, a big fancy machine. So people tend to think those look pretty good. We have some smaller versions of that, but then they have these paper, rapid paper strip tests um, that you can now go to a CVS and actually pick up finally. Um, it took a year for that to happen. Um, that cost about $1 to $5 a test. In other words, nothing if you're having to go somewhere and you're trying to be safe. Um, the other problem with the standard PCR test is the results could come in one or two days. Whereas these rapid tests, you got the results between a minute and 15 minutes, depending on the, on the, on the case. Um, so they had huge advantages 
if our goal is I want to identify who's infectious and isolate them quickly, I want a quick test and I want to be able to test a lot of people, including ones specifically who do not have symptoms. Um, by the way, some of the regulations here were against that. They said you were not allowed to test anyone unless they had symptoms <laughs> and with any of these tests, which is kind of crazy if the problem is the people without the symptoms from an information standpoint. And that's what I mean, that this isn't an obvious thing throughout the public health and pandemic management system, that it's an information problem. But as soon as you see it that way, you start to think very differently about the tools at your disposal. But it's also a particular sort of information problem. Here's the sort of trajectory of the viral uh, load, this orange line here, from the point of exposure to whenever. Um, and you'll notice that it rises and then rises extremely rapidly. And, and this uh, scale doesn't do justice to this. When I, you know, I, I don't have a, none of us have a big enough screen to capture the sheer increase in the, the viral load that occurs during the infectious period relative to just when you're infected. And the standard PCR tests, which are the ones that everybody was relying upon, were what is called very sensitive. So they could pick up any trace of the virus in you. Um, whereas the rapid tests were not as sensitive for that. But here's the interesting thing. Is there such a thing as being oversensitive? Um, if you have a fire alarm, a fire smoke detector, do you want it to pick up the slightest minute thing of smoke? Well, no, because every time you cook in the kitchen, <laughs> it would go off. Um, you only want it to be above a certain threshold. And so the same is true here for the tests you use for detecting COVID. You don't care if someone is just infected with COVID. You care if they're infectious. And infection is correlated with the viral load. And the rapid tests were uh, just as accurate at picking up whether you're infectious during that period as the PCR test, as sort of is demonstrated in this diagram here. So in other words, if my interest is not diagnosing does someone have COVID or did they have COVID or they're getting over COVID or any of that sort of stuff. My interest is I want to know if someone's infectious right now so they can, I can remove them. Well, these rapid tests are actually providing more precise information of that because they're overlapping with the infectious period more than the PCR tests, which are uh, basically for, if you took a random person who had uh, infected with COVID and gave them a PCR test, two thirds of the time, the COVID's already dead in them. They're already on the tail end. They're not even sick anymore. <laughs> and then you're going to ask them to quarantine for two weeks and all that sort of stuff. And so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's very disruptive. Um, and we're seeing a bit of that occur now with vaccines because of course you can test positive but not be infectious in some cases. Um, Slovakia by, late last year, got the message on this and decided to run an experiment whereby they, um, over the course of two weekends, twice tested their entire population uh, during a, an outbreak. And you can see uh, that it brought the cases which were surging all the way down because they were able to take, you know, they were previously taking a couple of hundred people and isolating them. And then over the course of a couple of weekends, they took 50,000 people and isolated them. That's 50,000 people who could have spread to others. Um, so they did a great job there. But once they got over that, of course, the virus popped back again. And so that experience uh, indicates that Testing is not something you can just go and intervene. I mean, unless you do it New Zealand style and get all the way to zero um, <laughs> cases in the country, um, it, you can't just do that. You've got to continually do it as an ongoing thing. In other words, this is an information problem that at certain stages of a pandemic is an ongoing information problem. Um, now these days, Slovakia actually uh, realized that and now they put in uh, more regular testing um, and they, you know, by May, had brought their cases all the way down. Um, it started to creep up again because Delta is, is different and harder and, <laughs> and things like that, but it did a very good job. Austria, its neighbor, um, they also introduced the same sort of thing uh, and they introduced it into schools. And the first thing kids do a couple of days a week in their classrooms is they conduct their own tests. Um, uh, and uh, you know, they're, 
you've got eight or nine year olds swapping themselves at a time where, for instance, if you go to Australia right now, you are not allowed to conduct a rapid test on yourself. You have to have a healthcare professional with PPE and all this sort of stuff to conduct it. You can have a $5 test, but if you have to go travel to someone who's a professional and line up and do that, the costs skyrocket. That's not a solution because you really have to get the cost down. Um, so uh, just to give you the indication of how this sort of should work is if you had a place, and, and MIT already has this, US colleges did testing regimes where they test people regularly twice a week. Um, uh, Canadian colleges did not do this, hence we all stayed at home. Um, but if you do this in a workplace uh, and you pick up some cases and you are able to isolate them, um, you save multiples <laughs> in terms of infections because especially for something like alpha or delta variants, um, missing those cases and having people walk around leads to the sort of exponential rise very quickly. But having regular screening once every few days uh, allows you to break that change of train of transmission. In other words, people walking into MIT, you're just as likely to have someone walk into MIT who's infectious as you would anywhere else. But the point is you then find that person and you stop them from continuing to do that. <laughs> um, so you break that chain of transmission. So armed with that knowledge, in August last year, myself and colleagues at the University of Toronto did something kind of crazy. Uh, it was suddenly crazy there because we, if you remember back to August last year, the pandemic, you know, the cases were really low um, and there was a summer and things like that. We haven't had a vaccine yet or anything. Uh, but, you know, there was a concern that it might surge back again, but suddenly a lot of people thought, we were already done. But we decided there was this risk that it was going to get even worse, which of course was borne out that it, it did. And the idea was to implement the thing that I wrote in my book, The Testing Economy, um, at scale um, in Canada. And so how we did this was really unusual, um, um, but, 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 and it's interesting in of itself, and I could spend all day talking about it. But uh, we got together 12 Canadian companies. You can see their logos there. Some of them you would have heard of. Uh, some of them are uh, sports teams like uh, um, MLSE, the MDA is the thing that made robots for space um, and things like that. Um, and um, got together uh, and they each brought a direct report from the CEO to work out how to implement rapid uh, testing, actually, we didn't call it rapid testing, we called it rapid screening because tests triggered public health officials into the workplace and uh, to run some pilots and do things like that. And so we actually set this up and, and, and did this activity. Um, and the idea was, uh, uh, was to, as quickly as possible, get to scale and implement this to keep the economy open at the very least uh, uh, throughout this. Um, and this is an interesting model in of itself. Uh, it, it, it is, it, in retrospect, is based a, a little bit of, uh, you know, of what Rebecca Henderson has described in her book, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire, saying, you know, when everybody else fails to solve a public goods problem, the only people we can rely upon are the large established firms. Now, I must admit, I was a little skeptic of this idea, and it only occurred to me halfway through actually implementing it uh, without realizing it, that we were, that this was Rebecca Henderson's suggestion. Um, and so, so we did this very odd uh, construct. And so here's how basically that we are uh, going. Uh, it's, it's taken some time, but you can see that we've got massive increases going on in the number of uh, organizations over time. Uh, it currently says 70 organizations. We just, this is exponential growth. We just passed uh, a thousand organizations um, uh, implementing this stuff. So it was very quick once we worked out what we were doing. The, the whole constraint of course was that the regulations at the time were against this. So we had to do this in the hope of changing the regulations. So kind of like an Uber style um, uh, push on this stuff. Uh, but that was done 
Um, we've now run, you know, 700,000 of screens. And, and on the back of this, and this is important as well, was a data collection effort because these were pilots. So we had to collect the data. And so we have the biggest data set in the world of the effectiveness of testing. But I want to show you this graph here. This is from one of the companies that came in in the midst of them having their own outbreak. Uh, so this uh, gray line here is the number of presumptive positives that they were having at the, at the time. And you can see the blue line is they started to implement rapid testing and, and really brought it up to, to thousands, you know, 35,000 people uh, every, every uh, week getting multiple tests a week. Um, and you can see that as they did that, the, 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 the um, outbreak was squashed. So instead of closing down for weeks or longer, they were closed, had to close down for a matter of days. And then when they opened up with screening in place, uh, they were able to keep themselves open. Uh, and so there are no, there's some 10,000 employees at, at these various workplaces being regularly screened twice a week. And they've been able to keep all of that under control and to stay open since. And we've got other examples where organizations would have been shut down, but just stayed open and things like that. And now, of course, all this is being hopefully rolled out in schools. Just to go on to another thing briefly um, uh, regarding this, which is, of course, um, uh, testing uh, is very useful. The problem with testing is that it even can be still a little bit late. If we can isolate the person, that's fine. But during the period before we catch that person, we might be a little bit behind and they might have also spread to others. Um, and so the way that gets dealt with is another very old informational tool, which is called contact tracing. And contact tracing sort of allows you to get ahead of a virus. Contact tracing is broken down a little with the Delta variant because it's so damn quick, but it you know, was something that was used very effectively in at least half the world to control COVID this time, including Japan. Um, and we can start to think about some of this stuff from an information theoretic perspective. So, you know, you have a signal is basically that someone's exposure to somebody else who's infectious predicts their own infectiousness. And the decision is to use that information to isolate. So it's a, it's a funny sort of decision we've got going. Um, the question is, is that the right way to frame the information challenge to individuals? We've got something that gives you a signal of whether you might be exposed and we tell you to isolate. The alternative way, uh, you know, obviously in that environment, um, you know, South Korea have implemented that and they, they actually put all the cases on a map and you can actually see if you've been exposed. Obviously in, in Canada and the US and other places around the world, uh, when Apple and Google got on the case, they gave these contact tracing apps. Uh, those haven't been as effective, mainly because of lack of adoption has been the main problem there. Um, obviously, the, the South Korean solution is very low privacy. Uh, this app uh, notification is high privacy. It's also high discretion, um, but which has actually better information. And it's not actually clear. Both have great information. Uh, if they get used, uh, they both have great information. Uh, the issue is who who actually gets to act on it. In South Korea, that information goes publicly and someone can enforce and track down people, make sure they're isolating. For these app uh, notification uh, things, they, there's no control at all. Um, so we have this sort of like interesting trade-offs going on between privacy and, and so on because of this decision allocation. Um, and the enforcement of isolation has related to privacy and also to altruism. Do you actually isolate yourself? So it's a very complicated set of decisions going on. The question is actually, and we should ask ourselves in these sorts of environments, can we actually reframe the decision problem and the information required for it? And, and, and some uh, uh, a mathematician at Carnegie Mellon University and his, his startup has come up with an idea for that. So they looked at it from the point of view of network theory. So it's contact tracing is sort of one degree of separation away. Uh, you, and then you, if, you're a, if you've got an issue, then you go to friends and family. Um, and you get some information regarding that. But it might already be too late <laughs> uh, to, prevent, to prevent them from being infected. And so you're in this sort of race. Um, wouldn't it be better um, uh, if we could recognize that the virus has a network property like this? And if we understood that entire network of likely interactions that people have, because most people's interactions are, of course, 
fairly stable. Um, then we can actually get a, 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 a forecast of how close is COVID to you within the context of your network. Um, and so you can look at the exposure network with the degree of separation, and you can use advanced prediction, AI prediction, other things like well, to look at the increase of risk in the network. So you can see, um, therefore, oh, there, you know, we think the virus might be a few days away from you. Maybe you should switch up your mask from a cloth mask to an N95. N Maybe you should stay away from some of your usual contacts for a little bit longer <laughs> and things like that. Take more care, individual. You don't have to isolate, but you should sort of be alert. It's in your network. Um, and so um, the idea is to mitigate your risk before you're exposed, not after you're exposed, um, which would be reframing the problem. And of course, it's potentially more private as well, because you don't have to know who it's coming from, just that it's on its way. So it's a bit more like a, a weather forecasting situation. And you could augment this and you could have vaccine risk taken into account and all sorts of other stuff to predict the network. And this solution called Novid has actually been rolled out in a few colleges. Georgia Tech ha uh, uh, has rolled it out, which sort of can give you this sort of uh, notification that it's how many degrees of separation are you away from COVID currently? based on your network. And that's a pretty interesting idea. Sadly, this was innovation in a pandemic. You're building the plane while, the, while, while you're still flying. So this hasn't been adopted as much as I would, I would have loved it to, to see it done. Uh, I haven't even been able to persuade our consortium members to <laughs> adopt this either. But it's the sort of thing that we need to do in thinking about what information do we need what actions do we want to take uh, in order to manage pandemics? And just relying on what our existing toolkit is uh, has really got us into trouble here. Anyway, this, you can look at novid.org if you want to learn more about that. Um, I write a newsletter still, uh, not as often as I used to, uh, uh, on COVID and related things. So you might want to subscribe if you're interested. But I'm happy now to take some further questions about any all of the above or other stuff. Yeah, I think there's the question in the chat. Um, Raphael, do, do you want to ask your question? You can come off mute and ask. Yes, uh, thank you uh, so much, Carrie, and I um, uh, appreciate uh, Joshua for, for the presentation. Really, really fascinating. Uh, the question is around, in a world very interconnected, um, the principles that you're sharing are, are country focused. And I wonder uh, what sort of solutions have you considered for handling this more at a global level? Thank you. Yeah, um, well, that's something I think about all the time. So there's, there's a few levels of this. <clears throat> no one is going to think that, the, uh, you know, it is fairly obvious that what we would prefer to happen is when a infectious, uh, uh, virus uh, arises, you want to sort of hit it at its source. Um, there is no doubt, whether it be information will cover up or what have you, um, we didn't do that here. Um, in other words, the reactions were, were way too slow in a global sense. And so, you know, I'd have to leave it to others to work out, you know, what global coordinated solution could be used um but that would be that would be uh you know obviously the best uh response but after that point then it becomes kind of interesting so you are right in the sense that this is interconnected so here's the here's the um uh, the problem so south korea great example had an experience with mers i don't know who uh in that i still don't know who in that entire uh, apparatus worked out that the, what they needed to do the next time one of these things arose is blanket the country with testing, get a test up and running quickly and roll it out and test as many people as possible in the right locations. But they did that. They did that targeted testing on key cities, testing at the border, all that sort of stuff. And they effectively avoided certainly widespread national lockdowns, but a lot of other lockdowns that everybody else was doing. Um, and so that, that economy just kept on running. Um, uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, did, the, did a similar sort of thing. Australia was uh, lagging behind 
uh, New Zealand in this, but they were able to quickly enable uh, both testing and contract tracing to, uh, to try and resolve this. Now, they haven't used any cheap solutions. None of these countries use rapid tests or anything like that. Um, they weren't quite available right at the beginning of the pandemic anyway. And we didn't understand a lot uh, that was going on, but they did use those other tools. And so they've had a relatively uh, good time of it, except the rest of the world, North America and Europe, the main culprits, um, didn't do those things. And the pandemic raged, uh, variants emerged. Uh, and as a result of that, um, those countries are sitting there, you know, uh, South Korea is doing a better job, still able to manage it informationally. Um, in Australia, that has got away from them. Uh, Delta has been too hard for their systems. And since they didn't bother to vaccinate quickly enough or to invest in rapid tests that could allow them to really uh, aggressively deal with this, um, those countries uh, have had problems. So, but this is the interesting thing about that. So you sit there and you look at that solution and say, well, we need a global solution for that as well. So, but I'm more of a mind that um, once it is well, we want people to understand that it's an information problem, but once that is understood, there are a variety of different ways you can hit at it. For instance, in Japan, they didn't do testing at all. They relied solely on contact tracing, you know, and, and that did serve them very, very well until the Del Delta virus came along. I know the P Olympics sit there and said, that's a red herring. Uh, that's, a, that's just a happenstance. Um, uh, so, so I think, uh, you know, so I think actually countries can actually uh, manage this themselves. Um, the problem is we, we can't afford to have countries not manage it at all. So it's a bit like how we manage monetary policy. We have some coordination at a global level, but people make their own decisions about how they're going to manage their local currencies. And so uh, at the end of the pandemic information solution, the, the last book, uh, I write about uh, that, that analogy between what you want from central banks and what you want from, from this. And uh, I lean towards local investment and local solutions in preparedness for this. Thanks so much, Josh. Do we have any other questions? Come on, leave it, lift it all behind. <laughs> <laughs> so much, Joshua. I really appreciate it. And um, Sinan, thanks you as well. He had to go run and teach 300 students. So he sends his regrets for not being here for the very end. But thanks so much from all of us. And for next week on September 23rd, we have Professor Nicholas Ashford from MIT Sloan, who will be speaking on actions we can take to address misinformation and safeguard the freedom of speech. So be there, same time, same link, and we will see you all. Um, and thanks so much for joining us for our first of our seminar series this fall. And we look forward to seeing you next week and beyond. So thanks everyone. And a special thank, thank you so much to Josh. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>